All right, I would like to welcome and everyone to this transit talk. Good afternoon and welcome to RVA Rapid Transit's Transit Talk. Um, this is our monthly webinar where we give you information and updates about what's happening with tr public transportation in the Richmond, Virginia region. Um, we're very thankful to have you all here with us today. And so my name is Faith Walker. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm the executive director for RVA Rapid Transit. And as many of you may know, RVA Rapid Transit is a nonprofit dedicated to advocating for frequent and far-reaching public transportation in the Richmond region. And we focus on that in three ways. Uh, one of the first ways is we wanna see buses go more places. So more buses, meaning frequency. We wanna see buses become more frequent. 50% of GRTC buses right now run every hour. And so we want to see also buses go more places. So right now, 80% of all buses run within the city limits. We want to see buses extend out to county lines. Um, secondly, dignified places to wait. And so we are advocating for shelters and benches to be um, all around the region so people have a safe um, and comfortable way to catch and wait on the bus. And last but not least, we work on elevating riders' voices in transit planning and decision-making. So today, um, I wanted to just also thank our community partners, um, Bonds of Course, who's representing here today, um, the Community Foundation and the Energy Foundation. So thank you guys for supporting us. So I wanted to begin, I want to go over some housekeeping details. We are recording today's event. So um, if you are, if you want to listen to this again or share it, you can visit our YouTube channel to do so. Also, to keep down on background noise, we ask that everyone stays on mute. And we'll have a proportion where you can ask questions to our panel. Um, and then you can just leave your questions in the comment chat box. And what we'll do is if you can put hashtag Q, that way I know it's a question. So definitely make comments or um, throughout the event. But if you put hashtag Q, that way I'll know it's a question. And also, so before we get started, I wanted to give you some transportation news in the region. So recently, GRTC just announced, um, and they voted in favor last Tuesday, the bus operator increase, employees getting the biggest boost. So generally, when you came into GRTC, um, you only can make $17.43 an hour. Um, and now that has boost up to 40%. And so that had and that increase goes across the board. So 17 to 24.91, that's huge. Um, and so as GRTC is facing reduced service and lacks of reliability due to the operator shortage, we believe that this will be a big boost in, in changing that. So before we get started to, with the um, panel discussion, we do like to play writer's voice comments. So what I want to do right now is play a writer's voice comment. Generally, we have transit ambassadors. Uh, one of our transit ambassadors here with us today. And our goal is to definitely collect the stories and concerns of bus riders. We ask, what is the impact of the lack of service in their community? And we met Isaiah, and this is what Isaiah has to say. All right, and make sure my volume is turned up. All right, here we go. Can y'all hear that at all? Uh, no, I think you need to share your audio. Okay, let's see. All right, let's do this think because I had to have phones on. So let's try this again. And when you start to hear, um, whoops, when you start to hear me, hear them, give me a thumbs up, okay? <laughs> All right, let's see. Let's try this again. My name is Isaiah Norman. I'm um, the routes that I usually take are um, going into downtown or coming to Southside Plaza. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm a recovering addict and um, I definitely depend on the bus in order to make different meetings. The um, zero fare has really helped me with getting around and being able to, you know, um, focus on my recovery and not have to focus on other things. Um, the recovery center that I'm at doesn't allow me to work 
So I really do depend on the bus system to get around. Um, sometimes the frequency of the buses do interfere with me getting to meetings, but um, you know, if the maybe the frequency of the buses, especially maybe on weekends, could increase, that would definitely be a um, big help to me and definitely like a lot of others. We have a over a hundred men in our building, and they they definitely do really support. Um, depend on the bus to get around, but um, yeah. No problem. All right. So as you can see, wow, I'm glad that conversation or that comment came because that's perfect with what you just we're discussing today. And we have ran into so many folks who are relying on public transportation who are transitioning to recovery. All right. And this comes from Timothy. So let's listen to Timothy's story. Uh Timothy Ruffin. Um my routes. I come from Chesterfield, <clears throat> so I take the Chesterfield Commons um, bus to Metro City, Richmond. Um, I will have to, I have to plan things around <clears throat> whether I get a job in Richmond or whether I get a job in Chesterfield. It actually comes from whether I'm going to have transportation or a bus line in Chesterfield or a bus line in Richmond. Um, <clears throat> so with a decision like that, it has to be certain sacrifices that you have to make. Sometimes you lose sleep. <clears throat> Sometimes you are tired to even do anything, to even catch the bus for two hours, uh, to wait for an hour bus. Um, it's an inconvenience. Um, it's not a practical idea for people that's in Chesterfield to have to come to Richmond for work when they can just work in Chesterfield. Um, other than that, uh, a bus line for me, it will help with time, it'll help with convenience, it'll help with, with deciding whether I want to sleep an extra hour or not. Wow. It decides whether <clears throat> I want to stay at work for an extra hour. Um, if not, I would have to catch the four o'clock bus all the way back to Chesterfield, which will cut time of my work because that's the only bus that goes at that time. If not, I will have to catch a Lyft or catch an Uber, which is extra money. And then um, that goes into whether I want to eat a steak tonight or a McDonald's tonight. But uh, tell me the rough and that's my story. Wow, that was a powerful story that comes from Timothy. And then he's just speaking on the challenges of using public transportation when you live in the counties, in Chesterfield County in particular. And a lot of folks who rely on public transportation may not have um, salary positions, they work off, off of hours. So the fact that if a bus is not coming frequent um, within their time frame, or a bus is not coming during their shift, it really impacts their income. And he expressed that so well. So thank you so much for sharing your story, Timothy. So we're gonna jump right in into the meat of this. I'm so excited to have this conversation. The, the comments and conversations that both Timothy um, and the other gentleman had really ties into the conversation that we're having today, social determinants of health and how transportation interacts with it. And so today I am excited to have Capricia Smith Spellman. Um, she's with the Office of Community Wealth Building. And then also Sean O'Brien, he's with Bon Secours, and then Flora as well. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna call on Sean to introduce himself. Give us your title, Sean. Give us um, who you work for and also your role in the community and what you do, and how do you see transportation and issues like we just heard from these two gentlemen affecting people in your work? Great. Thanks, Faith, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm really excited to be on the call here with you today and talk about transportation, which is so, so, so important to uh, people's ability to live a healthy life. So my name is Sean O'Brien. I'm a director of community health for Bon Secours. And really, if you think about the community health team at Bon Secours, we are really focused on people's health 
outside of the hospital walls. So we provide medical homes to the uninsured. We provide healthy wellness and nutrition programs out in the community. And um, we also uh, invest in community partners that are focused on uh, the social determinants of health. And so one of the things that um, is always, always one of the biggest challenges for anyone who, or any organization that is working, whether it be affordable housing, um, economic empowerment, uh, job creation, access to health services, education, social uh, and uh, emotional connection within neighborhoods, all of these things have a current running through it that is the challenge of transportation. And especially for communities of uh, black and brown communities, public transportation is such a key component of their lives. And, you know, Timothy broke it down in, uh, in his testimony, really talking about hours. And that really is what it comes down to is public transportation, the frequency, where it goes is not only connection to all the social determinants that impact somebody's health, but it really impacts how many hours in a day somebody has in order to live their best and fullest life. Thank you, Sean. That's pretty powerful. Um, now, while we're on the conversation of Timothy, Timothy mentioned um, how transportation impacts his income. And so we have someone here who is dedicating basic their career right now into building wealth in the communities of the city of Richmond. So I want to invite Capricia Smith Spellman to tell us, um, introduce themselves, tell us their title, where they are, and what what they do for the city of Richmond, and how does public transportation affect their work day to day. Hi, um, hello everybody. I'm Capricia Smith Spellman, the director of the Office of Community Wealth Building. I understand that is a, a new name for a lot of us, so I would love to explain that we offer everything from career services to supportive services. So transportation is a big deal for us. We do understand we have seven barriers that we're focusing on this year, transportation being one of the largest. And here at the city of Richmond, it's our desire to make sure that every family do more than just survive, but that they have an opportunity to thrive. And in order to do that, we need to help them overcome some of those barriers to workforce um, development, in, in workforce development specifically, but in ways that help them build wealth for their families long-term. We serve a lot of community members who just need a hand up to um, get access to resources that can help them not only build wealth, but develop an avenue by which their careers can be more stabilized um, or develop them for that matter. We provide uh, resources and training for individuals who wanna trade up and they wanna do something different in their lives. They wanna change careers altogether or just do um, obtain more credentials in the career path that they've chosen. So we do a lot of supportive services and wraparound um, applications for our team members so that they come in and get, again, the opportunity not just survive, but thrive. So transportation for us has been one of the barriers that have been the hardest nuts to crack, for lack of a better way to put it. And we realize that partnering with an organization like this has been the leverage that we need to make sure that we can impact as much change as possible in the community so that individuals who have access to those jobs that can create the most wealth for them, they have the ability to get to them. And so we noticed that our county partners don't always have supportive systems of transit that allows individuals um, who do not have their own personal cars or reliable transportation for that matter to get to those lucrative positions. Positions. And so um, this partnership, as well as expanding policy recommendations with you all to make sure that we can get those barriers taken care of are things that are priorities for our office. So thanks for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for um, coming. And I'm so excited about the continued partnership with RVA Rapid Transit in this office, um, because a lot of people, RVA Rapid Transit started six years ago because there was a study um, done by the Brookings Institute that ranked US cities um, in their relationships to jobs and public transportation. Richmond ranked 92 out of 100 US cities. So we're eighth from the bottom when it comes to people using public transportation and asset accessing employment. 
And, um, and so that's a huge part of the reason why we do the work we do, because 51% of the reasons why people use public transportation is to get to work. So thank you so much. We're excited to continue the conversation and the partnership uh, today. Um, now I want to invite Flora, Flora to introduce herself, the work that she's doing right now, her title, her role, her organization. And please, Flora, tell us, um, what you're doing and how the relationship to public transportation affects your work. And recently, um, the city of Richmond just announced um, a state of emergency in regards to housing. So I'm so excited to have Flora to help us with that conversation today. So Flora, please introduce yourself. Yeah, hi. Um, so my name is Flora Valdez de Pena. Um, I am a junior associate at um, HD Advisors. Uh, HD Advisors is a uh, consulting firm that works in the affordable housing space. Um, some of the big work we do is um, that we serve an organization called Housing Forward Virginia, um, with which we do a lot of policy research um, and kind of coalition building um, and uh, you know convening of various people in the housing space to to generate ideas and talk about issues and figure out solutions in housing. Um, and that's a statewide organization. Um, another organization that I work with is called the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust, um, which is a, an affordable homeownership uh, program in the, in the city of Richmond and the counties of Chesterfield and Henrico um, that uses a community land trust model to center um, you know, um, community control and ownership, as well as permanent affordability um, and combating gentrification and displacement. Um, and within that as well, I also help out with uh, the Richmond Land Bank, um, which is the land bank for the city of Richmond that basically helps transfer uh, vacant and underused properties that are owned by the city into, um, you know, better community serving uses like affordable housing. Um, aside from that, I also, um, you know, work with a couple other clients, um, just developing policy solutions, doing housing research for their areas, um, all kinds of things like this. Um, really, um, transportation is, is one of the biggest kind of secondary parts of my work up besides housing, right? Housing is the center, but like, but like transportation is one of the, is one of the biggest, um, factors that we see influencing, um, you know, just housing affordability and especially like geography, um, you know, where housing is available, where it's not available, where it is in relation to the jobs of a region, where it is in relation to the services and the, and things like this. Um, yeah, uh, and then in addition, um, transportation is something that's very important to me. I, uh, <laughs> I'm just a big, I'm just a big, uh, a big fan of transit, um, especially of, uh, I'm kind of a big rail fan, so uh, trains are really fun for me, but um, I am always excited to have the opportunity to talk about transit-oriented development, housing, affordability, and health uh, as well, which is another big factor that we talk about in our work, um, housing as a social determinant of health, and the ability to, you know, be mobile as well. Well, cool. um, Flora, so since you um, are already speaking, can you just tell us, um, hone in a little bit more on what are the challenges that you're seeing right now, especially when we're uh, associated with integrating public transportation and affordable housing. Um, so tell us what the challenges are that you're seeing, and then what could be some opportunities that we can have to mitigate that too? So the challenges that that we see on the kind of um, on the side of of creating affordable housing, um, which is a lot of what we focus on, um, are that um, a lot of it really has to do with the supply of land, right? Like finding land for affordable housing is really really difficult um, because you know a lot of the times private nonprofit developers are competing with. Um, large for-profit developers who are buying up big chunks of land. They're also competing with, um, you know, land speculators, for example, in, um, you know, uh, places with hot markets like Church Hill and other areas. Um, we find ourselves 
the community land trust, for example, can find itself competing with um, folks who are just trying to snap up land and homes as quickly as possible and flip them to make a quick buck. Um, and a lot of what that has to do with, a lot, a lot of the effect of that is basically land that is uh, not as accessible in terms of transportation ends up becoming the cheapest. Uh, and that kind of ends up becoming where affordable housing uh, gets built. Um, there, uh, you know, a couple of the big um, projects that the community land trust is undertaking right now are uh, suburban subdivisions, which, you know, in terms of money, the community land trust can get a lot more bang for their buck in terms of how much money they spend on acquisition uh, versus how many units they can create if they're building way out in the suburbs, right? But the problem with that is you build way out in the suburbs, right? Your families who are gonna move in there, right? They can afford your house, but can they then afford transportation? You know, can they then afford to buy a car and own a car, something which can cost up to like $10,000 a year? Um, we don't know. So that is, I think, really one of the big challenges. Um, and I think an opportunity to um, face down that challenge is, um, <clears throat> I think that um, the idea of using publicly owned land, uh, city owned, county owned land um, for the creation of affordable housing is something that can be really valuable, especially when there is a lot of um, property uh, in those kind of areas that are attracting attention from, you know, developers, et cetera. Um, so for example, um, in Jackson Ward, um, you know, um, because of the effects of uh, redlining and all of these historic patterns, of disinvestment, um, there ends up being a lot of tax on property. City takes a lot of the tax on property, right, and then starts auctioning it off. Um, you know, trying to make back those taxes it lost on it. Um, <clears throat> but it just feeds the cycle of speculation more, and eventually, you know, Jackson Ward starts to heat up a little bit more in terms of starts becoming trendy again. You know, investors start going in there looking for land houses to make a quick dollar on. Meanwhile. The city still owns a bunch of land and there's a choice, right? Do they want to sell off that land and make some money on it? Or do they want to use it to create something important like affordable housing? So I think one of the opportunities with this is using this publicly owned land um, in you know better connected areas, places that have transit access um, to create affordable housing. Um, and that's something that I think um, I'm trying to kind of um, do with the Richmond Land Bank program, um, which I help run, um, which, like I mentioned earlier, takes that uh, you know city-owned uh, land and uh, tries to funnel it into affordable housing and other important places. Um, yeah. Wow! Thank you so much for the work that you do. It's so important. And one of the things that you really honed in on is the cost of owning a vehicle. And so when um, when affordable housing goes out, and, and that's what's happening <laughs> to a lot of folks, people are moving in out of the cities and they're moving out into the county lines and access to public transportation is few, far in between. And so what tends to happen is you have to purchase a vehicle. That's what our region says. If you're gonna, if you want affordable housing, you're gonna have to buy a car. And so, since we're talking, um, and AAA estimates anywhere from five to ten thousand that it costs. So, owning a vehicle is making people um, poor, basically. Um, it is stripping them of their income. And so, since we're on the basis of income, I want to talk to Capricia. Capricia, can you just hone in on um, some of the things that you're seeing as far as access to public transportation and the relation to um, the relationship to promoting economic mobility? Can you just talk a little bit about that? Um, I just want you, if you could repeat the context of the question. Sure. So, the, so what role, I guess, can public transportation play in promoting economic mobility? 
oh and interesting job opportunities, especially for low income folks. And so um, the cost of owning a vehicle, I mean, bus riders right now, 54% of bus riders make 25,000 and under. And these are folks who are working full-time jobs. And so the cost of owning a vehicle is almost keeping them in that ratio. Um, so please express why public transportation is important to economic mobility. Yeah, I'll say um, for the majority of the jobs that we find um, individuals are interested in, uh, just outside of healthcare with our new relationship with Bon Secours, of course, um, we find that the majority of the jobs that have the best um, pay scales are out, they lie in areas outside of our regular transit pattern. So um, we noticed that the local counties, the counties in the surrounding areas have better job opportunities, or at least have more lucrative job opportunities for individuals that we serve. Unfortunately, without um, adequate transportation, individuals, of course, can't access those jobs. So what we've, we've continued to partner with a number of institutes who have uh, private transportation services in the event that our um, tra transit system can't provide that level of access, but we noticed that that is the largest expense of the supportive services that we offer. So if in fact we could increase um, the public transit system to incorporate more of the outlying areas, I think we'll find a greater increase in not just opportunity for individuals to access those jobs, but access wealth, because it would give them an opportunity to have something to save, have something to set aside, have something to use for other purposes. Um, your efforts in zero fare have made quite a difference um, already. And so if we could expand something like that for a more permanent fix for individuals who do have lower income um, outcomes, that would be tremendous. And so continuing to work through the creative ways to make sure that not only do the, our individuals have access to public transportation or extensive public transportation, but also have access to gaining some level of wealth with ownership of their own maintenance of vehicles and you name it. So um, we noticed that even, um, I think it was two summers ago, we helped individuals get bikes when our bike trails and those types of things increased in the area, we were able to help individuals get bikes um, and you'd be surprised just the autonomy that it provides to be able to provide a way for you to get to a job and what level of um, confidence that builds and so I imagine if we were able to do that with just a bike can you imagine what we could do if individuals had they knew that every route for every shift that they work they would be able to have adequate transportation to get them to and from so that they can accept th those things that will help them build wealth in the long term I think that would be tantamount to how we get things done and so I'm just eager and excited and um positively thinking about ways to make sure that the, that access in, is increased. I am also talking with um, organizations that come into our fold. So let's say we have new employers. I'll just use Lego as an example. I haven't had that conversation yet, so don't go anywhere. But um, in, in talking to businesses with our economic development division, we would like for businesses to come ready to support individuals to get to those locations. Of course, we know you, know, you have to build a plant in a place where there's the most landmass, but we want the, the employer to help us invest in how to make sure that the employees of choice can get to those locations and provide them the adequate service that they need. We could do soft seal screening and get those employees ready, but if we can't get them there, we can't provide that best um, accommodation to the new employer as well. So we're just asking them to help us think about how to make sure that is not a barrier any further. So as we come up with creative ideas like that, I think we could continue to move the needle forward to make sure that those opportunities are available to everybody. Again, we believe every family deserves the opportunity to thrive. And the only way to do that is to make as, every situation as equitable as possible. And so transportation is one of those things that is not equitable across our city. We need individuals to have access to that so that they can get to where they need to get to. Thank you. You mentioned some successful um, avenues that has helped with you partnering with local transit agents or smaller transit transportation agencies. You mentioned bikes. I want to ask this question to Sean. Um, are there any examples of public transportation projects or initiatives that have improved health care outcomes? Um, so Capricia mentioned some partnerships, some efforts like bikes helping outcomes to work, but is there any outcomes that you can think of that has, has helped people? Um, well, I'll tell you, 
you know, as far as there have been some solutions that I would say workarounds that you can always cite. So, for example, um, all the health systems in uh, in this community within their electronic medical records they actually have can order transportation through Lyft or Uber through that electronic medical record. Now that's addressing someone's immediate need to either get home or get to the doctor. But the the key, the reason that's a workaround and not really a solution is because the clear and most intentional solution is to have a viable, useful, uh, frequent uh, public transportation system so that you don't need a doctor or someone with access to an electronic medical record to get you from your home or your workplace to go see the doctor and more importantly, get the preventative care that you need so that you don't have to end up in the emergency room when some your health has become so bad that there's uh, you've got to go see a doctor immediately. Um, there, I will say that we've had Bon Secours had a um, successful partnership with GRTC in investing in uh, bus shelters uh, in the East End of Richmond. But um, again, I look at that as something that is really just a Band-Aid and that should have been there already. <laughs> so, um, you know, just from looking across the country, I, I, what I've seen and learned about as being really successful are transportation, uh, public transportation departments like um, the department in Minneapolis, St. Paul, that really focus on putting the community and their voices and their needs at the forefront of their transportation planning. So a lot of this points back to the great work that RVA Rapid Transit is doing on that front, because that really does so much when it comes to advocating for increased investment and uh, increased planning for expanding public transportation. And especially when we're talking about uh, regional approaches where you have an entity like GRTC, that is um, made up of representatives from the city and the counties. Um, transportation and really centering on the rider's voice is a really effective way to advocate and really build up the regional approach that is truly the solution to making sure that we have adequate investment in um, public transportation. Great. Um, now, I know there was some cities who had done zero fare pilots and on a particular route, they saw an increase of people visiting doctor's appointments or having gone to their doctor's appointments. Have you seen or any of you guys seen and Capricia mentioned um, the benefits of zero fare to folks that she is supporting and helping, but Flora or Sean, have you seen any benefits of zero fare in the work that you've done? I'll just say from a health system standpoint, we are just now starting to track that data okay. so that when patients come and interact either with a physician or in the hospital where we are actually doing social determinants of health screenings, so we can identify whether transportation is an issue for that patient um, just in their daily life, or also if it's an issue with them being able to follow up uh, on appointments or visits or screenings and so forth. But, you know, health systems are really coming to this game rather late. Uh, just anecdotally, I know that, um, you know, it wasn't until a couple of years ago that if you were to get scheduled for a follow-up appointment or for an imaging appointment, that uh, your appointment and where you would go would be based upon where you actually lived there wouldn't be those questions even asked. The assumption was that anyone could, the assumption was that you wanna have the appointment as soon as possible and you can get wherever you need to go as easily as possible because you have a car. And we all know <laughs> that that's not the case. So uh, there are changes internally, but there's just so much work to be done. 
Flora, did you have any comments on that or if not, that's okay. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I was, um, I mean, I, you know, we haven't really encountered any, um, I haven't really looked at the data uh, around zero fare in the Richmond region at my work um, as of late. Um, you know, um, we, my firm helped do a um, housing uh, strategy framework um, for um, the Richmond region um, a few years ago. Um, you know, did the study in 2019, presented the findings in early 2020. Um, so obviously things changed pretty rapidly after we uh, found that out, but um, we have been working on an update to that recently. And I, I am curious as to whether um, we looked at zero fare. I'm not, I'm not sure if we did, but I, I think that is a definitely, because you can imagine the benefits that zero fare has for housing accessibility, <laughs> you know, um, like I mentioned, like, um, you know, the affordability of transportation really is as important as the affordability of housing. Um, and, you know, if someone has affordable housing, but they don't have affordable transportation, even if they don't own a car, if they have to pay, you know, $2, whatever, every time they have to ride the bus um, anywhere, um, that starts to add up. And so you can easily imagine how zero fare um, made housing, you know, kind of in a sideways fashion more affordable, but I haven't looked at the data myself personally. Yeah, perfect. Because um, one of the things that we've noticed is that what zero fare offered people was no barriers. So right now there were barriers for people to use public transportation. And to some folks, a dollar and 25 cent may not seem like a large barrier, but for a lot of folks there are. And also too, what we realize is that zero fare, the majority of folks who are using public transportation um, during, so if you don't know, zero fare was implemented by GRTC and as well as um, transportation agencies around the nation in 2020 to reduce the spread of COVID-19. And, um, and one of the things that we advocate for as for RVA rapid transit is we realize, okay, we made national news um, in 2021, when we realized that our ridership didn't decline as much as other regions. Why is that? People were working from home um, and who would risk catching COVID-19 or being exp exposed on a public service? And that was essential workers. We realized that the folks who lived in this particular region, the majority of people who use public transportation were the essential workers. Actually, during the COVID-19, we noticed that GRTC ridership increased. So was it because of um, the, we had a housing issue, we had income issue, people losing their, their jobs, we had issues people losing their home and their incomes. And so people were transitioning over to public transportation. Um, could it be that they couldn't afford a vehicle? Could it be that they lost their employment? And so, or was zero fare an incentive for them to change what they're doing. And we want more people riding the bus, right? Because it reduces emissions, it reduces um, congestion on the highway. So we want more people using public transportation. So that's a great thing. And so, um, and also what we realized is that, you know, folks who are making 25,000 and under, instead of them recuperating the benefits of buying the $60 transit pass that allows you to ride unlimited, a lot of folks weren't doing that. And it wasn't because they wasn't, um, they didn't want to, it's just because $60 a month straight off was challenging to afford. And so we found that people um, who are making under 25K are paying actually more um, because they're doing each trip. And so, um, and this has really put money back into people's pockets. So I just definitely wanted to just explain that zero fare is so important for this region. All right, and so what I wanted to also ask, um, let's see. Sean, I mean, we're already talking about 
healthcare, right? And we're talking about reducing costs in people's pockets, but what role can public transportation play in reducing healthcare costs for individuals? Um, have, we, have we thought about that? Is there a conversation about that? Now I know free fare is reducing the cost and it's removing barriers for people to get to doctor's appointments, but how can public transportation play a role in reducing healthcare costs? Yeah, I mean, you know, the when we all this started with I was talking about the social determinants of health and how transportation runs through all those social determinants where you live, your where you go to school, interacting with your neighbors. Um, and you know, studies show that those factors 80, to live a healthy life those factors make up 80% of what it takes for you to actually live a healthy life. Your, the care you get from a doctor or within a hospital really accounts about for about 20% of your ability to live a healthy life. And you look at the inverse of the way the history of uh, transportation investment in this uh, country, and we see that um, 80% of that investment has gone into roads, bridges, uh, highways. And we also know that um, predominantly uh, black and brown communities depend on public transport more than anything else. So the correlation with um, somebody's health, you'll see that 80, 20, um, you know, you, you'll see that uh, ratio pop up a lot, not just because it's easy, but because it is historic fact. And it is the reason why systemic racism, the history of development in this country has disenfranchised black and brown communities and why they are uh, more, they have less healthy lives than uh people who live in upper income, mainly white communities. So when we talk about the connection between someone's health, the connection is, is that if you don't have an ability to get to your doctor as much as you need to, if you put off taking your son or doctor to go see uh, their, uh, get their vaccinations, if you um, suddenly get sick and you can't show up for your um, job that is pays you an hourly wage, that you are in serious uh, danger of really finding yourself in a life jeopardizing situation. So um, we can always look at health costs and how you might reduce it, but sometimes I feel like that just overlooks what, what the real basic uh, calculus is for people in the US without public transportation, they're gonna live less healthy lives because of the impact that has on all these other social determinants of health. Great, well, thank you so much. I really wanna ask more, you guys more questions, but I want to um, give us some time to dive into these, com these questions that we have. And so, um, this is comes from Anne. Does the size of a city's population have a predictable relationship to the amount of public transportation initiatives that the state is willing to fund in comparison with other states? And in the U.S., do transit planners say that a city should have two million residents in its metro area in order to be a good fit for a large network of buses such as the Pulse or light rail? And so um, I do believe that cities. Um, now, I know for a fact that the state funding, GRTC, or our region has get, been getting the majority of state funding when it comes to public transportation. And here's why. Um, there's a funding formula that says, um, based on our state, that it looks at ridership. And whoever regions has the highest ridership, they will receive the largest pot of state funding. Richmond has been getting the biggest pot here lately. And I really do believe it's because of zero fare. Um, Hampton Roads Transit, as well as Charlottesville and other pockets are still trying to recoup its ridership back. They cannot get the ridership numbers. Now, generally HRT or Hampton Roads Transit was getting the largest pot of state funding. 
Um, so it's really that state funding is really based on ridership and Richmond has been getting it. And so that's another reason why zero fare is so important for this region because it's in, in some ways paying for itself. Um, I do believe that if zero fare were to go away, it would reduce our ridership, which will in turn reduce the amount of state funding that we get. And so it's very important that we can continue that. Um, and let's see, um, can we, can you talk about ways to increase access to family that have been forced out of gentrifying neighborhoods, such as bikes and microtransit? How does that work? Um, so, Flora, I'll ask you: Has there any been any initiatives or anything you know right now that that is happening right now? Yeah, I, I, I don't really know. I, I think that. Okay. Um, this, no, it's fine. I think the um, our region has a, I think a troubled relationship with the concept of gentrification. Um, exactly. I think people are very willing to name it when it's happening and see where it's happening, right? Like we can, you know, we all know that like Church Hill, for example, is under underwent and is undergoing like rapid gentrification. We know that Jackson Ward is at risk of gentrification. Manchester and the surrounding areas are at risk of gentrification. All of, you know, these um, old city neighborhoods um, that, you know, saw a huge amount of white flight and became, um, you know, majority black and brown neighborhoods are now seeing uh, a big amount of kind of, um, you know, market-based reinvestment that primarily serves uh, young white folks. Um, but it, it feels like a lot of, you know, in a lot of ways we're hesitant to do anything about that, and I, I I get the sense that a lot of uh, a lot of folks see it as not necessarily a negative thing that um, that neighborhoods are becoming, you know, wealthier and whiter, um, and so um, I, I think that influences the way that people react to it a little bit. I, I don't I don't feel that there has been a huge amount of attention paid to that um, in terms of creating programs to help folks who have been displaced. Um, there's been a lot of attention uh, to it from the nonprofit community. Um, I think, you know, um, Maggie Walker Community Land Trust, like I mentioned, is really focused on um, trying to stave off gentrification by creating permanently affordable homes in those neighborhoods. Um, Richmond Land Bank uh, is focused on trying to, you know, prevent um, <clears throat> land speculation, um, which is kind of a precursor to gentrification. Um, um, but in terms of actually helping um, folks who have been displaced stay mobile and stay connected to their community through transportation, um, I don't I don't see that there has been a ton of, of work done around that as of yet. There's definitely opportunity too, though. That that means there's opportunity for that to happen, and. Um... And I just want to mention that Maria mentioned um, that the zero fare is important, especially with folks who are, into, are in between housing or homelessness. So thank you so much for that comment. Um, also, we have seen, we know that people, um, Tapricia, I know you probably, if you can just quickly explain when people come in for appointment, what was the relationship and the process of you guys providing bus passes when there were, uh, when there was um, a fare involved? And one of the, we've had someone mention that they wouldn't have been able to get to work if it wasn't free, because generally what happens is it, it takes two to three weeks for you to get your first paycheck. So the, you know, you don't have money to, to even get to work. So Zero Fare has helped people launch them into a career or for uh, employment. So can you expand on that a little bit, how, what that process was? Um, typically, again, supportive services, our, our goal is to eliminate every barrier if we can. So I would put people in houses if I could. So um, we, we do any and everything we can to make sure that the barriers that are um, impending or keeping people from getting to the resource that they need um, we, we do our best to make sure we mitigate that as much as possible. Transportation, of course, being one of those larger ones, um, we would purchase bus, bus tickets. And you would think with the support, and this is no shade at all, but you would think with the level of support, almost $40,000 a fiscal year of our purchases that we would get like a couple free or something, you know, yeah. but uh, didn't quite work that way. And so it, it was quite a lucrative expense um, to uh, try to support that need. But you know, I, I just feel like 
any barrier we could eliminate. If we run out of money, we just run out of money because at the end of the day, we need to make sure that individuals have as much access to transportation and to the career pathways that are the best for them. Um, we, we need them to have as much access as possible. So we would just purchase them each year. And again, we use a lot of our, exhaust a lot of our budget just to make sure that the supportive services were taken care of. So the zero fare has made quite a difference even in the way that we can reach out to people because we're now able to use those resources in areas like um, temporary housing and, and some of the other um, down payment assistance, you name it. So some of the other areas that are not always as easy to access. So. Um, it's been a blessing for us, and we just hope that we can continue this and make it a more permanent fixture so that we can move on to the, to the bigger issues of right. uh, our housing mm -hmm. crisis. So Anne mentions that as a writer, I roll the pulse as often as possible for the pandemic, and at the time, zero fare had not happened. But I did wonder if employers ever participate in policy of helping the city justify paying for the pulse, but also making it a great option for their employees. This is something they need to do as uh, I live in a city in Europe, and it seems smart for the point of view of encouraging more affluent writers to continue writing. I like the idea of different levels of fare for different categories, job seekers, retirees, workers, um, and so is this an idea frowned upon by RBA Rapid Trend? Not at all, not at all. Um, I think we are for zero fare. And the thing is, um, and the reason why I would lean against a tiered fare is because one thing we've learned is that $5.8 million was expected to be collected in fares in 2022. Yeah. And so um, maybe 4 million of that, um, it's actually collected at physically at boxes and with dollars from people, right? So the other, I guess, 1.8 million came from um, companies who want their employees or their students to ride the bus free. So like VCU and other employees who would pay into the fares uh, up front so their employees or their students could use it free. But only 4 million was actually really collected from all. And GRTC's operating budget was close to 70 million. So fares only make up 10% of their operating budget. So it's so small. So fares do not really push zero, um, excuse me, um, support GRTC in a huge capacity. It's a small piece of the pie. Um, and so 4 million is physically collected. It costs 1.7 million to collect fares. So we're spending 80% to collect the 4 million. So 80% of what we're collecting, we're spending to collect it. Collecting fares doesn't make sense. So the idea of having a tiered may not make sense now when our region becomes more robust and we have buses and BRTs going into the county lines and it's more convenient, it's far reaching, then we may can discuss a tiered uh, fare service. But right now, um, being that buses run every, 50% uh, of buses run every hour, it just doesn't make sense to collect anything at all. Um, it's, it would be wise for our region just to invest the 5.8 million to recoup the benefits of the housing issue, um, the healthcare issue, and even the um, people's jobs and income. So go ahead, Flora, you have something. Yeah, um, I was gonna kind of continue this, this discussion, which I find fascinating, the zero fare discussion, um, because you know a lot of extremely huge transit agencies in the US don't have zero fare. You know, New York MTA doesn't have zero fare. Um, you know, Chicago CTA doesn't have zero fare all of these things um, and they're huge, right? But probably the reason that they don't have zero fare is because they're so big and because so many people use them that they actually do rely on fares as a significant portion of their funding. Um, and Anne has been talking, asking a few questions. Anne, I, I see your questions in the chat. You've been asking a, a bunch of questions about how, like transit funding and how things work. And it's like um, really difficult because as Faith was talking about, you know, transit funding is allocated based on ridership. And Richmond has a big, you know, um, percentage of the transit ridership in the state of Virginia. But, um, you know, for like big capital projects, like building out more BRT, uh, you know, lines and, and other things like that, or even rail systems, right? That requires federal investment. And in terms of a national scale, our ridership is nothing practically. Um, because we're such a small city and because, um, because such a, a small kind of 
proportion of our population actually rides the bus, right? 80% of people who work in Richmond, in the Richmond region get to work on their cars. Um, and so it's really difficult to get big funding for big transit projects, which then in turn makes it difficult to build big transit projects that attract more riders of choice, which then makes it more difficult to um, justify collecting fares. Um, so it's all this big kind of cycle um, that I find really fascinating. And I think one thing that could be really interesting that Anne mentioned in the comments is, is that um, there's a big company uh, in the East End that um, uh, is from is from Europe, and she, uh, you know, Anne was asking about uh, whether they'd be whether <laughs> they could like apply some progressive European social practices um, and and ex help expand transit. And I think that getting companies to in help invest in transit systems and like getting companies to fund their own transit lines when they when they um, move into here would be a, is a fascinating idea in terms of economic development. Obviously, I don't work in economic development, but I just think yeah. Yeah. I'm so sorry. We won't be able to answer everyone's questions, but Anne, I want you to join our Mobility University. I'm going to have one of our transit ambassadors email you information about that where we go into transportation funding. Um, and so it's a five week training course where we teach bus riders on how to self educate and all the questions that you have been asking and we dive a little bit deeper into that. And then Maria also too, uh, we'll send you some information on pedestrian and transit riders we have a portion um, of our Mobility University dedicated to pedestrians and that's led by Brent Lutendahl with Bike Walk RVA. So transportation and walking and biking is hand in hand. And so uh, with that, thank you so much, guys. I want to and thank you to our panelists for um, coming. This was a great conversation. I wish we had more time to dive deeper into it, uh, but we just don't have that time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just um, go into some announcements, but again, thank you. This was a wonderful conversation, Anne, and thank you. So, um, so thank you. So give me one second, let me transition. Again, thank you to our panelists. All right, so I wanted to go over some announcements um, with you all on what's coming up next. And so let me pull that. All right, so coming up next, we have a, um, on Saturday, May 6th, I wanna invite everyone to our beer and buses. So this is an opportunity where we're engaging with the community. We'll have a special guest, Scudder Wag. He is with Jared Walker. Scudder is a nationally known um, transportation planner. He helped with designing the, re the redesign of RVA Rapid Transit, um, excuse me, RVA's bus network. So GRTC's bus network, when this, um, the Pulse was installed, he was responsible for redesigning it. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a tour where we're gonna visit different breweries and you can ask Scudder all your transportation questions and comments, should things go on this way or why the buses doesn't run this way. So we invite you all, it's absolutely free. Only thing you have to pay for is your own beers, but we'd love to have you join us. Um, and we're gonna be, we're gonna start at two at Bingo Beer and um, our transit ambassadors should be dropping the links in our chat right now. So you can join. And you can also visit our webpage to get more information about that. Um, also, between May 14th and May 20th, we're encouraging everyone to ride the bus. So ride the bus week. You can scan that QR code to get more information, but we're gonna be promoting ride the bus. So choose um, to ride the bus all that week, or you can choose one or two days out the week to do run an errand, but we're encouraging everyone to ride the bus. All right, and then our next transit talk will be unpacking the state of transit report. So make sure you visit our website to join our next transit talk where we're going to be going over our report. And so um, Richard and Diana Hall, uh, our current research fellow, has been doing a deep dive in um, our current um, status or the current routes that we have currently based on census data. And so that's a really powerful, impactful report. So we want you to join us for those. And then what I wanted you to do is, again, number one, take action, ride the bus. So again, when I mentioned to you that um, our region receives state funding. The more you ride the bus, the more we have state funding. So that's the least you could do is ride the bus, y'all. So definitely, um, 
ride the bus during the ride the bus week. And number two, adopt a stop. Um, you can visit our website to find more information about that. And if you have a transportation story, especially Anne, we would love to hear your story. You can call 804-286-0007. And then again, donate. Um, the support that you give us helps us continue to do the work. So we encourage you all to donate, help us out. And then there's a link should be um, in the status there. But again, thank you so much for joining another Transit Talk by RVA Rapid Transit. We look forward to connecting with you. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.